We'll continue. Are there any questions so far? I feel I'm hurrying this a lot. Yeah, Janet. Um, the speech by Don Brash and this uh, invocation of a single nation, and then even just what you've been saying about a single legal system, makes me think about the um, name New Zealand, because that is the name of the country. But a lot of people are now calling New Zealand Aotearoa to sort of signify this biculturalism. Um, what's your view on that? I mean, it's never been officially inscribed, has it, that it should be changed, but a number of people choose to say New Zealand Aotearoa. What's my view on it? My view on it reflects what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, that's my view on it. Um, um, one view as a South Islander I have is that um, it, Aotearoa is more of a North Island word and it's, and, and it's a rather, yeah, thank you. And I get a little annoyed with that, like Kamate, the, the haka, is a North Island thing against some South Islanders too. So I'm, I have a rather complicated reaction to it. Um, I don't wish to say more. <laughs> But uh, I, I should hasten on with my academic discourse. <laughs> um, so, so as I say, the, the legal assimilation assumes a settled le legal hierarchy and that this hierarchy will come up with uh, solutions as to who has what rights and, and solutions as to how these rights will be enforced by the state. Thus, the Waitangi Tribunal is empowered as a permanent commission of inquiry to hear the grievances of any Māori or group of Māori caused by governmental power since 1840, and it's charged also to recommend government action to alleviate the prejudice from which they consequently suffer. Thus, too, the tribunal is empowered by Parliament to interpret the treaty in both its languages and to apply the principles of the treaty it thus discovers in deciding when the principles have been ignored or overridden. Thus, Finally, the, treat, the tribunal gives equal weight to European and Māori custom in making its findings as to claims of prejudice. But by law, the tri tribunal doesn't have the last word. The courts are not bound to accept its interpretations except within the ambit of the statute that empowers it. And so there are parallel histories of treaty signing and interpretation produced by the tribunal on the one hand and the courts on the other. The tribunal has often spoken of limited, even shared sovereignty that the state holds vis-a-vis -vis Māori. It has hinted that Māori have inalienable rights to share in state power and in other various matters. The courts, on the other hand, don't question the final authority of the state and assimilate Māori rights into the common law as rights by Aboriginal title, to customary Māori land titles to the rights of consultation and limited control in certain areas of statutory settlement, and so on. For its part, the government, except in circumstances laid down in statute, is legally free to ignore the tribunal's advice, and it's free, though at much greater political risk, to change the law if it doesn't like the implications of a court's decision. Of course, there's a politics to all this, and the Labour government's decision to remove the right of Māori groups to go to court to assert Aboriginal title to the foreshore and seabed caused great upheavals. Following the decision to replace the right to go to court with the statutory regime which denied it, there followed another great hikoi in 2004 comparable to that of 1975. There followed, too, the founding of the Māori Party and a confidence and supply deal between them and the dominant National Party in 2008. Both parties prefaced their agreement by agreeing to act in accordance with Te Tiriti of Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi, and, in agreement, uh, and the agreement's terms included a promise to repeal the offending legislation and to review the constitutional arrangements of the country, especially as they concerned Māori representation. In 2010, Mr Key, now the leader of the National Party, was to be found criticising the reiterated views of his predecessor, Dr Brash. And in 2011, Dr Brash, still espousing his one nation, one law philosophy, became the leader of the ACT Party. All the political parties in the country except ACT were happy-ish with legislation which not only restored Māori rights to a court hearing 
as to Aboriginal title to the foreshore and seabed, but envisaged special guardianship rights over certain areas being reserved to certain hapū. Such special rights, it might be thought, had been comfortably brought within the aegis of the law of a liberal and democratic state. But, and now I'm finally reaching a conclusion, there will always be an awkward fit between the assertion of the mana of Māori fundamental groups and the fundamental right claims they make on the one hand, and on the other hand, the assimilation of those groups and claims to the authority of the state. Some elements of the relationship between mana Māori and the state go perfectly well. The overwhelming majority of Māori, iwi and hapu politicians are perfectly willing to negotiate with the state and to live in accord with the agreements they make. It's a game they've been playing for some time to great effect. And the state has often proved willing to recognise special Māori rights in the law it makes and develops, transforming Māori fundamental rights in the process into liberal special rights. But a symptom of the awkward fit is that Māori right claimants, as, as in a number of iwi settlements and in the new foreshore and seabed arrangements, see the arrangements they come to as only temporary staging posts to a more ideal future, or simply expressions of an ongoing partnership and not as final settlements. The problem, if it is a problem, is that the principles on which special Māori rights seen from a Māori perspective and special rights in a liberal state are founded, uh, uh, and the rights that and, and, and the principles on which rights in a liberal state are founded are simply different and can be in, incompatible in their implications. The principles of mana Māori deny the overriding authority of the state or any external body to create or vary them. Arrangements like the Treaty of Waitangi or the many statutory treaty settlements may to a degree conveniently recognise and protect those rights but it is from Maturanga Māori that they gain their legitimacy and binding power. In this situation, Māori state politics are irreducibly the politics of negotiation among equals in moral weight, if not equals in power and influence. Intra-Māori politics are similar. Agreement to settle disputes in certain ways may be reached among Māori contestants, but those agreements need and will last only as long as the sovereign, sovereign will of each fundamental group continues to endorse them. To sum up, Māori fundamental groups are much like sovereign legislators, and special Māori rights derive from these iwi and hapu sovereigns, not from the legislation of the state or of any external Māori body. On the other hand, Special liberal rights depend on the existence of a liberal democratic method of deciding who shall have what rights and on the legal protection and furtherance of those rights together with the rights people construct in the contracts and the agreements they make freely among themselves. Liberal special rights, it need hardly be said, depend on the continuing and sole authority of the state to articulate and to enforce them. There's not time for me here to draw the constitutional implications of this difference in principle. I conclude simply by saying that thinking about the difference can and has easily led to the conclusion that in New Zealand, Aotearoa, that the law flows from two sources, from mana Māori motahake, the separate mana of the Māori on the one hand, and on the other, from the legitimacy of an inherited liberal democratic state. If it's not derived from those two sources together, the thought may and does proceed, then it must be of one of them, uh, from one of them to the exclusion of the other. This is not the terrain that any constitutional, uh, sorry, this is the terrain that any constitutional review of New Zealand must negotiate. It's not an easy one, deriving as it does from a combination of a European heritage of belief in the rule of a system, of a single system of law over a territory, combined with both Māori and Pākehā adaptions of European ideals and national self-government. I don't know whether it would be wise for New Zealand to follow Ireland's example and adopt a written constitution. That might make too clear what's best left unclear. 
But I do think it's evident enough that the UK territorial devolutionary solution to national differences cannot be applied. What the UK and Ireland can learn from New Zealand is, of course, for them to say. But I think some attention to the nature and bases of liberal special rights for the disadvantaged and for minorities might be a good place to start. I think this is immediately evident in the English case, but even though it's true that in the Scots and Irish cases the minorities are fewer and smaller, such attention may well save some human suffering and make them better places to live. Thank you very much. I think Thank the idea is... Kuntumihi, Kia, Kui, Andrew, Uncle Korero, Kia, Matu, Thank you for your talk tonight. I've just come from, not long from home, and to hear you speak so eloquently about our journey, which is ongoing. My marae is aro whenua, and the, 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 our whare is te hapa o nui tarini which is saying the grievances of this place, of this new land. And um, your, your talk to us tonight has been about that, and you've spoken so eloquently. Tēnā kui mihi kia Thank you.